In this video, we'll learn to think of molecular orbitals as linear combinations of the atomic orbitals that we've already seen. Associated with every atomic orbital within every molecular orbital is a value c that we call an LCAO coefficient that indicates the contribution of that atomic orbital to the overall shape and energy of the molecular orbital. c has the effect of dilating or contracting the size of the atomic orbital and potentially changing its sign or changing its phase based on the sign of the coefficient. Adding and subtracting these coefficient multiplied atomic orbitals produces the shapes and energies of the molecular orbitals and in fact those properties shape and energy are directly related to the extent of the contribution of each atomic orbital. The larger the coefficient is the more important that atomic orbital is to the overall shape of the molecular orbital. Molecular orbitals are just linear combinations of the basic atomic orbitals that we learned in the last video. This naturally leads to the question how do we arrive at the proper linear combinations that say yield the lowest energy solution? This is really a question for physical chemistry. Organic chemists are more interested in the interpretation of the results of these calculations, not necessarily how they work. And so I want to talk about the LCAO process in general terms and spend more time on the interpretation of the numeric results and how to translate the numeric results into shapes and vice versa. So the way the process works is basically like this. We begin with a specified structure which tells us the number of electrons in the molecule and where the positions of the atoms are. It also tells us the soup of atomic orbitals that we will begin with. Computational chemists call this the basis set. For us, this is going to include the 1s atomic orbital, the 2s atomic orbital, and the 3 2p atomic orbitals for all the atoms associated with the molecule. So here I've drawn water. We'll have a 1s orbital for each of the hydrogen atoms, and for the oxygen we'll have the 1s, 2s, and the 2p levels. At this point, we take all of these atomic orbitals and essentially throw them into a magical black box that you really don't need to know anything about. This black box finds the lowest energy linear combinations that hold all the electrons of the molecule. And that's what you see as the results of the calculation. What the calculation gives you is essentially a series of equations which specify these linear combinations. The equations might look something like MO1 is some coefficient C times the 1s orbital on hydrogen 1 plus another coefficient times the 1s orbital on hydrogen 2 plus another coefficient times the 1s orbital on oxygen, etc., etc., for all the atomic orbitals on all the atoms. And an MO is specified for all of the molecular orbitals found by the calculation. An important principle of the LCAO method is that the number of atomic orbitals in equals the number of molecular orbitals out. And intuitively, you can understand this by realizing that if all the atomic orbitals were filled, we'd need a place to put all the electrons. And so we need at least a number of MOs equal to the number of atomic orbitals in. So essentially, the important parts of the results are these coefficients C because these are going to be unique. Remember that we knew already what the shapes and the mathematical functions of the atomic orbitals were. These coefficients c are really what are interesting to us. And you can find these in what we call an eigenvector table. In such a table, the columns are the different molecular orbitals, mo1, mo2, etc., and the rows are the different atomic orbitals, and I'll just abbreviate those, AO1, AO2, etc., and you'll see the C values within the table. Since the atomic orbital functions are specified, these Cs tell us what the shape of the orbital is. And they do that because the Cs either will expand or contract the size of the lobe, and they may change the sign of the lobe if the value of C is negative. So let's see how that works. Imagine we had a coefficient of 0 0.5 times the 1s orbital. 
What's that going to do to the shape of the orbital? Well, it's essentially going to contract it by 0.5. So the orbital will get smaller. If the coefficient is larger, say 0 0.8, the orbital will still get smaller, but it will be a little bit bigger than the result of the 0 0.5 multiplication. So the coefficient will either dilate or contract the size of the orbital. Within this linear combination, you should also notice that orbitals are added to and subtracted from one another. What this looks like is essentially the merging together of lobes or the canceling out of lobes. So imagine two 1s orbitals added together. When two orbitals are added together and they have the same phase or sign, we see them merge together into a single sort of blob with electron density between the two nuclei. When two orbitals are subtracted from one another, well, this is the same as adding two orbitals of opposite phase. And in this case, what you'll notice is that now we are adding something positive to something negative, resulting in a canceling out of electron density between the nuclei. What we see in the middle will be a node, in fact, and the result will be an antibonding molecular orbital. So molecular orbitals are built of these addition and subtraction interactions coupled with the dilations and contractions that we see from the C values. In a molecule like water, for example, we might see an orbital that includes a large just blob of electron density that might look something like this. And the way we interpret this orbital as organic chemists is to understand that it comes from S contributions on all three of the atoms of water, and all of those are the same sign, leading to addition and what we call constructive overlap. Subtraction, which leads to a node between the nuclei, is termed destructive overlap. These are the foundational ideas of the linear combinations of atomic orbitals method. In the next lesson, we'll look at some specific examples of organic molecules and how we can interpret these linear combinations that come out of molecular orbital calculations. But an important thing to keep in mind is that you won't be expected to calculate LCAOs. Instead, understanding how to interpret them and see the molecular orbital output as collections and linear combinations of the atomic orbital input is the valuable piece for the organic chemist.